Thank you, Christina. The creation of visual representations of lost buildings and interiors from detailed research has long offered people the opportunity to engage more easily with complex and sometimes highly technical information than is possible to do through text alone. But conventional artistic methods such as sketching create only two-dimensional images and allow ample room for that convenient fudging of details which are uncertain or controversial. We're all familiar with the building disappearing into the mist in the back of a drawing. Traditionally built 3D physical models are time-consuming and costly to make and tend to set an impression in stone or wood, which then becomes fact. The centre for which I work uses 3D digital modelling and offers a different way of interacting with research, new methodologies and faster processing times have opened up this field as a use in use for ongoing research tool as well as for the creation of innovative and engaging interpretation for public engagement. Digital modelling has moved on enormously in the last few years with greater efficiency and much more realistic results than before. It's possible to create in many ways a near photorealistic architectural model, although character modelling and human animation is still harder to do really, re really convincingly, as anyone who saw Rogue One and Peter Cushing will know. <laughs> modelling as a tool for testing hypotheses, however, and exploring the physical reality of spaces poses challenges as well as opportunities. The creation of immersive near photo real models allows users to enter an evocation of the past as never before, but that raises serious issues about transparency and authenticity. Through the outputs of a current research project in pilgrimage which we are undertaking funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, I want to explore briefly in this paper the issues and opportunities around dealing with uncertainty, the use of comparanda conflicting evidence and the desire to create a satisfying environment without misleading the user. The huge appetite that has grown in recent years for immersive experience modelling, where users can choose to explore an environment and elect what paths they want to follow. So the project in which we've been engaged, Pilgrimage in England's Cathedrals Past and Present, has explored the questions of the pilgrim experience in the medieval past and the current experience of visitors to cathedrals today. And as you can see here, we've worked with four partner cathedrals, Canterbury, Durham, Westminster, Roman Catholic Cathedral, um, and York. But what I want to talk about today is the work that we've done with Canterbury on the recreation of the medieval pilgrim experience. So you might reasonably ask why model the Canterbury experience? Within this project, um, we've modelled four Beckett-related sites within Canterbury with, with which pilgrims would have interacted. That is, the site of the martyrdom itself, his original tomb, the main and glittering medieval shrine in the Trinity Chapel, and the smaller but much more exclusive head shrine in the Corona Chapel. In doing so, we've drawn on extensive archival and archaeological data both some of which we've undertaken ourselves on the archival front, but much of which has been gathered over many years. The modelling, which I will show you shortly, has not only allowed us to test various hypotheses about pilgrimage to Canterbury, but also to bust some myths. For example, there was no fixed route around the cathedral. We've proved through the use of archival research within the modelling that the experience within the medieval cathedral was that pilgrims would elect to go to whichever of the four sites they were able to access, either by um, virtue of the time of day, the time of year, their social status, or the need for which they were going. The popularity of the cult of Thomas Becket has allowed us to explore, through material evidence, in a number of repositories and museums, a way of recreating as accurately as possible the physical experience of being a pilgrim in that space. What could you see? What could you hear? What could you touch at each of these four key sites? And how did their usage vary one from another? Canterbury was a monastic cathedral in the Middle Ages. So how did the monks manage the popularity of the cult alongside their daily routine? And how was the pilgrim experience managed 
or as we've discovered actually, even stage managed. Canterbury is extraordinarily well documented in this regard. There is a shrine keeper's manual in a customary that survives from the 14th century. There are numerous miracle stories. There is, of course, the famous uh, Canterbury Tales of Chaucer and the later Tales of Berin. Pilgrimage and the idea of pilgrimage is still a big thing for Canterbury. People start on the Via Francigena from there. Many people start on their journey to Santiago de Compostela. People end their pilgrimages there, and for many it is a, still a site that is exactly that, the beginning or the end. So exploring within that, within the model, how the building that people experience today was shaped, in terms of the East End certainly, entirely shaped by the cult of Thomas um, and his martyrdom, tells us a great deal not only about the building and how it can be managed today, but how people can experience more of that than in the Protestant somewhat stripped out cathedral. So the key sites that you can see here, the tomb is in uh, number one, the crypt, which is um, at the top right, which is obviously uh, below ground. The main shrine is um, in the Trinity uh, Chapel, which is uh, the area marked as number eight, and the little bit sticking sort of out of the end, the little head shape bit, is the Corona Chapel where the head shrine was. And then number four um, is the site of the martyrdom, which now has a, a relatively modern artwork on it, but had uh, an altar, which was where Beckett himself was um, celebrating mass uh, when he was martyred. So what have we done? Um, so this is a digital animation of the um, shrine of Thomas Canterbury, Thomas Beckett of Canterbury, within um, the area of the Trinity Chapel. So this is entirely uh, a digital recreation. This is not a photograph with things dropped in. As you can see, uh, the shrine itself in this uh, animation has a number of different activities uh, going on around it. So here we have a couple bringing their child to give thanks for healing. You can just make out the uh, pilgrims praying in the niches at the side. There is a monk pointing out uh, the many jewels um, on the shrine to a couple. There's a group down here who are just passing the time of day. Uh, there's another group over here having the miracle stories within the windows um, explained to them. All of these activities are documented in the archival record. If you go to that site today, you will see uh, the Cosmati pavement, you will see the pillars. What you won't see, because they disappeared at the Reformation, is the huge jeweled shrine, uh, the cover suspended, which had silver bells on it, which rang when the cover was raised or lowered. You won't see those metal uh, grills because, again, um, they have disappeared. So the experience of the space today is very different. People follow the same route in the sense that they climb the same steps, they gradually move from west to east. But when they get to this space, what they see is an empty space with a candle in the middle of it. So by doing this, we are able to give people some sense of what they would have seen. But of course, what we can't do is make the people who are looking at this into medieval pilgrims with a medieval mindset. People viewing this are 21st century people with their own ideas, their own preconceptions, their own prejudices, uh, their own expectations. So whilst we can make this a very physically immersive experience, we could, if we wished, put this onto Oculus Rifts and have people looking around, although I'm not sure the cathedral would be terribly keen on that as an idea. Um, but what we can't do is imbue people with that sense of uh, being a person um, in the past. So. Modelling allows us to test these hypotheses and to take us so far, but it cannot um, take us truly uh, back in time in that sense. A rather different um, experience 
uh, both in the past and today, is the site of the martyrdom. What's recreated here is the, feast, the first mass on the Feast of St Thomas, which is the 29th of December. The first mass of the day would have taken place around 4 a.m. What we know from the archival record is that um, a relatively small number of pilgrims each year were allowed to spend the night in the cathedral. Uh, the cathedral provided them with bread and ale. That's worrying. It's not meant to be that dark. Oh, there we go, and we're back. Um, the, the cathedral provided them with bread and ale. Um, they were allowed to have a small fire in the cathedral, though we haven't actually managed to ascertain quite how they would do that, uh, presumably some kind of brazier or something. And they would then um, attend this uh, mass at the site of the martyrdom. So if you go to the Canterbury today, there is an altar on that spot and it has rather dramatic um, crossed swords over it. In the uh, medieval period, it had uh, an altar with quite elaborate hangings and quite an elaborate reredos, uh, which showed, um, the, showed Thomas um, as a saint and scenes also from, uh, from the crucifixion. So a very different experience, and realistically one that people cannot replicate today. There is no mechanism within Canterbury Cathedral for people to spend the night in the cathedral or to attend a mass at four o'clock in the morning, certainly not on the 29th of December. So those, that uh, presentation of uh, an experience for quite a defined group of pilgrims, as far as we can tell, these were people who um, either had undertaken a particularly arduous journey or had made um, a vow to walk a certain distance, considerably long distance usually, um, and to attend um, on this particular day. So quite a select uh, group of pilgrims. A different experience again is um, that of uh, a documented visit by the Countess of Kent uh, to the uh, Corona Chapel, uh, the place where the head shrine was kept. So in the uh, 13th century, Becket's head was physically separated from the rest of his body and enshrined, as was commonly the case, um, in a silver gilt shrine, heavily bejeweled. Access to this and to this space was highly privileged. Um, it was not accessible to the general pilgrim, and it's clear from uh, the documentation around the shrine keeper's accounts um, that basically if you paid a lot of money, you got to kiss the head shrine. Um, so we represented the Countess of Kent here with her slightly fidgety um, ladies-in-waiting kneeling on the stone. You can see here that the uh, head shrine was flanked by um, shrines of other saints containing um, multiple bones, but again, if you go into that space today, uh, that space is uh, largely filled with the shrines of, uh, with the tombs rather, of later um, archbishops. The final one, and this is one that's still in progress, um, is the modelling around the tomb, uh, the site of Becket's original um, burial down in the crypt. So when his body was translated to the shrine upstairs, um, the site of his original tomb and the original tomb casket we know remained as um, a site of veneration and appears from the records to have been the place where the longer term sick could go. People um, with, as one of my colleagues said, some of the more disgusting diseases um, could go and pray there for um, healing and wait there and in some cases could spend considerable periods of time there so an, a variety um, of ailments are represented. At the moment, as I say, this is in progress. This is far too clean. Um, there should be many more candles and straw on the floor and all sorts of things. Um, but it's exploring what that meant in terms of the use of this space, who would have accessed this space, and testing out some of the ideas which previously the assumption was that all pilgrims went to the main shrine. Um, and actually what we know from now from the archival research in particular is that 
there are terrific peaks and troughs in that. So pilgrims, uh, many pilgrims would go to the main shrine on particular feast days, but the rest of the time, judging by the income, because obviously people paid their pilgrim pence or paid for candles, the, the business, if you like, of pilgrimage was spread out um, across these various sites. Some pilgrims would go to more than one. Some pilgrims would come a considerable distance. Some would be very local. So by using this modelling, as well as producing for the cathedral um, a visually engaging output that says, oh, you know, here's some pilgrims uh, at a shrine doing different things and enabling them to explain some of those um, to their many thousands of visitors. It's also allowed us to test ideas about that people have had about what it meant to be a pilgrim because the assumption was that it was the sort of Chaucer model, that people came in a group, they went into the cathedral, they went to the main shrine, they followed a route, they bought their pilgrim badge and they left. And what the modelling in particular has helped us to show is that that, is not, that could not have been the case, not simply that it might not have been, that it could not have been, because the various access routes to those spots within the cathedral um, at different times of the day and um, with the monastic liturgy would be um, inaccessible, that the monks managed um, the pilgrim experience, that the east end of the cathedral was actually remodelled to heighten the pilgrim experience. You physically got higher and higher and higher as you went up the, the cathedral, and you glimpsed the shrine. It was very theatrical. The sight lines were very carefully managed, um, and so when you actually arrived, it was a real moment of, of revelation, which would have had a very strong experience, um, a very strong impact, rather, on, on people. So that's what um, we've been doing with, with digital modeling. Uh, as I say, it's still something of a work in progress, but we think it offers real opportunities for giving people a form of engagement and asking questions that are not possible in other routes. Thank you.